Welcome to Wizards Institute, the number one community to learn smart investing and financial independence. Alex Liu is the managing partner and chairman of the Board of Kearney, a global consultancy with 3,500 staff operating in 40 plus countries and 2019 revenues of $1.4 billion. He's also the co-chair at the World Economic Forum events, including the annual summit in Davos and the WEF on Africa summit. From his work at Kearney and formerly as partner at the Boston Consulting Group, Alex has advised CEOs and boards of top Fortune 500 firms in 50 countries. Great. Uh, good day, Alex. Thank you for being here. Um, I am so excited. I've been looking forward to this. First of all, it's a 20 plus year reunion. We haven't seen you for see each other for a while. That's right. But uh, as you know, we're finishing this book, 10 Commandments of Investing, about uh, really how to invest uh, as guiding principles, but especially in this crazy post COVID uh, world. And um, really looking forward to this because of your immense background. Um, you really don't need introduction, but I'd love for you to, for the audience that don't know you and don't know Carney, maybe just give us a bit about the scope of what you're doing and your company. Well, sure. No, thanks. And it's good to see you again. You haven't changed in 20 years, still have the energy and the youthful spirit. Well, you I look younger. You look younger than 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just good living, right? Um, but thanks for the opportunity. And I really believe in your, uh, the purpose of your exploration here. Um, Listen, I'm a managing partner and chairman of Carney, which is a global consulting company. We're global. We work in public sector, private sector. Uh, I'm a globalist myself. I was an immigrant from Asia, grew up in the Americas, been in the business uh, or the profession for 30 years. Um, you know, and I guess we touch a lot of the topics that you're interested in, sort of what's the macro background for companies and countries that are trying to reach full potential. Uh, we're a services firm, so it's a global firm. So we, during the COVID crisis, obviously, I had the same issues as uh, other leaders have, which is how do you keep people together, optimistic, safe, sound, uh, forward-looking, working on their uh, priorities, et cetera. So happy to be here. I mean, we're just uh, another citizen in the world. Sure. Uh, uh, Alex, tell us a bit about Carney. I mean, I, that's also... Uh, the company that I used to work for many, many years ago. But you're a global firm. I believe you've got some 40 something countries and offices. You yourself have worked in probably more countries than I visited, 50 plus as I want to say. Tell us sort of a bit more about the scope of this because it would set the stage about sort of obviously the insights you'll share with us. Um, listen, we're, I mean, we work for the Fortune 1000 private and public companies as well as countries. Uh, and economic institutions will do work for the World Economic Forum on a number of their assignments, for example. And what we're typically hired to do is to come in and help company go through either transformation or innovation. They both are linked together. So how do we uh, apply digital and analytics to our future business model? How do we become more global and optimize our global chains in a world of all kinds of upside down activities? Um, how do we nation build? from scratch, whether you're a developing economy or a com company or country in the Middle East, where we do a lot of work, for example. Um, and we'll work for a, a range of companies, all sectors, healthcare, telecoms, and technology, which is where I spend a lot of time and you and I work together, in fact, uh, oil and gas, consumer goods, financial services. So we are, I would say, the industry is an index for global change, and we're at the center of it, uh, usually. It, behind the scenes, we're not front and center. We're the ones helping provide the solutions and help maybe implement the change that uh, our clients would want to have done. Sure, uh, again, just one more question. I, you know, when I was at Carney, we did both operational uh, improvement work for the clients as well as strategic work, right? Just again, can you give us a flavor of some of that type of work for your, your thousand plus sort of fortune thousand clients? And then we're gonna weave that into sort of the investment angle. Yeah, right, right. Well, you know, I think our business focus is really in the space of what we call strategic operations and transformation, and they're very closely linked. So there are a lot of companies out there that have these fancy frameworks and visions, and they have things that are going on day to day. We're they usually asked to come in and make, make that happen, right? Match the vision to the strategy, the operations, the operating model, and ultimately the benefits and business case of everything you're trying to do, whether it's culturally or business-wise. And then that leads to what I've seen, at least in the last several years, bolder and more courageous moves by companies, clients, countries in the topic of transformation. It could be digital, could be national, it's socioeconomic, 
because the definition of success for companies these days, which I think should be a theme we talk about later, is much broader than just shareholder value, right? It's stakeholder success. It's the communities we serve. It's the people and capabilities of the teams that we leave behind, as well as the economics, ROI, all those kind of things that need to be taken into place. Um, so we'll do work for mergers and acquisitions and industry chessboard type of stuff, You're helping actually integrate companies that are coming together in a new economic world. Again, there's a lot of cross-sector uh, blurring these days across borders. We'll help companies fix their global supply chains. We'll help them get a new operating model. I mean, in COVID, there's just been this mantra of sort of reacting, rebounding, and reinventing. And what we see right now is that the first quartile companies and countries are looking at the reinvention side. Uh -huh. How do we relook at the way we do things? Uh, how do we reinvest? How do we invest in human capital? How do we incorporate ESG goals into the way we look at the future? Um, so it's, a, it's an exciting place to be. Uh, that's why I've been in it for so long, I suppose. Sure, sure. That's great. Again, thank you for that background. So from your perch as, uh, as chairman and CEO uh, running this global firm, Carney, really you've got, you know, uh, uh, what, 10,000 10, plus smart consultants working for you across the world, numerous industries. What did you and Carney see prior to COVID in terms of the state of the world? And, and I, I, this is more the global macro economy and then maybe kind of ease into where you see where, where we are today. Uh, and then we'll talk about the future a little bit. Well, I mean, going into 2020, uh, there was synchronous macroeconomic environment in terms of relative growth. I mean, we still had fundamental issues about equality of developed versus developing markets, uh, the digital divide in terms of the access to technology and even human services. Uh, but ultimately, the economic backdrop was fairly positive. And, you, and I think we had our best first quarter. Most companies did, too. And most countries would feel pretty optimistic about investing in infrastructure and the like. I mean, what's happened in COVID is that a lot of the underlying trends and problems have been accelerated, right? So all the digital transformation plans have been accelerated by five or six years. Um, the underlying economic justice and workplace uh, behaviors and culture of which there were lots of problems racially in the US, immigrant um, and tolerance around the world, gender diversity and equality, those things which were under the surface, so to speak, and happening, have also been accelerated and come to the forepoint. And again, the economic ups and downs and disparity uh, is crazy. It's a multi-speed economy, right? Depending on where you are, the pandemic, climate change, those affect us all equally as individuals. But depending on your country, uh, depending on your status as a small and medium business or a globally traded business, public company or a private company, a state and local government which has funding deficits or a country that is dependent on others for national security. It's been a very uncertain time. So I would say the current economy, the current context is that of a no normal or never normal world. I mean, even today, as we speak this morning, we heard that the president of the United States has contracted COVID, right? And so that has repercussions uh, beyond sort of an individual bubble. That's important. Um, I see that happening in the next year. Still uncertainty is the enemy of most proactive investments in business folks. Um, there's still going to be clear uncertainty. I think the disparity between first quartile and fourth quartile performance will be even more stark. I say to my clients that there is, there is probably no second or third quartile anymore. You're either going to be winners and big winners, look at the tech sector, look at the health sector, and the, uh, the, the bottom, the folks that don't change, don't reinvent and rebound. Uh, or are just, just unfortunate in terms of their competitive position. And unfortunately, there's a lot of that examples around the world uh, of that disparity sure, between sure. top and bottom. Uh, Alex, in your view, Carney's view, or even perhaps your client's views, um, yes, economy was roaring prior to COVID. Um, is this the blip in your view? Or, or, or do you think this is something deeper uh, I mean, you know, the classic V versus U versus W recovery. What, what, what's, your, what's your insight in that? Well, I mean, I think you have to look at it at several levels. I mean, at the total macro, 10 billion people in the world level, you know, 200 different economies, um, it's a deflation. I think the next year and a half will be, there's just mm -hmm. less activity. 
right? You look at the small and medium business sector, which is the heartbeat of most economies, including the United States. Um, you know, it's, you, you have 40 or 50% permanent closures that are happening. So you cannot argue with the total level of economic activity coming down. I think what's the story really is within the sectors and the countries. And we talked about the definition of success. So whatever business in, you're in and whatever country you're in, what has come clear to me and also over years of discussion by business people and government people is that there has to be a broader definition of success, right? Safety, security, security of supply chains, right? Just for your food and health, much less semiconductors and iPhone screens. Um, a feeling of justice, the feeling of economic vitality, being able to invest in the future, having the proper infrastructure, whether it's roads and highways or hospitals and healthcare. Um, those fundamental questions were never at the forefront um, as much as they are right now. And within any sector, if you're working for a capitalist company, uh, they could be in a tough sector, they could be undercapitalized, they could be over competitive. Um, there will be different choices. Uh, and again, we need each other to get through that. Some, in some of these companies, especially small and medium business, and some global trading companies will need government assistance. They will need um, cross-border alliances to be successful. They will need a framework beyond what they want to do as individual shareholders of company A, B, and C. Sure, sure. So we're more interdependent. Uh, getting out the solutions will have to require that interdependent thinking. And I think leaders that are much more holistic too, right? Not just sort of shareholders, but also workplace justice, diversity, inclusion, um, global supply chains, a sense of being able to manage risk, not just investments. Risk to those investments these days are complete wild card, right? Gotcha, gotcha. Yes, it sounds like Carney does quite a bit of work on the cultural aspect, not just the business or strategic aspect, which is, which is fantastic. Um, uh, in this past year since COVID, have there been any clients of yours as you develop the strategies, what is top level or operational, or see how they allocate capital investments? Have there been any clients that really stood out for you in terms of how they're investing and how they're reacting to this, this world? Anybody kind of, yeah, I mean, you don't have to name names. It could be, it could be anonymous. I know someone's confidential. No, it's tough to generalize because each sector was hit a bit differently. I think all companies went through a period of pause and shock, right? There was a three or four month period, including ourselves, where companies suspended guidance, they suspended forward plans, and the people, but then reality is sucked in, you know, you have to move forward. And again, that next two phases, which is rebounding and reinventing, requiring a complete rethink, actually, of the businesses that you're in, has taken place. So I think I would say across sectors, the companies that I see winning in the next few years would be those that actually got out of that mindset of being a victim to be one where we are proactive, we are not victims, we have assets, we have things we need, we have decisions we need to make. Um, and whatever sector, whether it's healthcare, oil and gas, financial services, broadband service providers, uh, consumer goods, redefining how they connect with consumers, B2B or B2C, I see a lot of internal revolution happening. So from a consulting, a selfish consulting perspective, uh, the level of change and momentum from a client need perspective has never been higher. Um, great, great. But the pace of that will change, right? Some companies are uh, having some difficulty, right? Liquidity problems, balance sheet problems, competitive problems, regulatory problems. Um, but in the long term, beyond next year, let's say, I, I see boom times for the change business, if you will. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, what uh, maybe we'll talk about geopolitics again? You're in a great perch uh, beyond CEO of, uh, Carney, but also being uh, ethnic Chinese American, like my ethnic Chinese American now Canadian, I guess, like myself. Uh, I know you're originally from Taiwan, and I'm from the mainland China. But how, how do you see this? What's your view of geopolitics, in, in particular, obviously, China-U.S. relations, right? What, is there any crystal ball or any specific position that you and your clients are, are I'm trying to, yeah. Well, I mean, I, it's obviously a, a key uh, factor in global investments, sort of the nature of 
uh, relationships bilaterally, multilaterally, and China is the beginning and ending of 70 or 80 percent of the world's supply chains, right? Both from a size of middle class on the buy side, as well as manufacturing and, and other uh, key parts of the global economy. I mean, 50 years ago, when I was an immigrant from Taiwan, at that time, uh, we were leaving Taiwan to go to the United States because we were worried about military activities in the Taiwan Straits and were fearful of being an immigrant minority in the Southeast United States where my dad was a professor for over 30, 40 years. Uh, 50 years later, now, it seems like it's the same. Nothing's changed. Yeah, it hasn't changed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, <laughs> the urgency of, of the action and the visibility of the issues are so, so prominent because everyone is dependent on each other. Right. China, China is such a, it's a source of carbon emissions as well as a source of manufacturing. So there's good and the bad. Um, and so it's, the interdependency is so much more clear now than they were 50 years ago. At that time, it was just sort of block A versus block B versus block C. Now we still have block A versus block B versus block C, but the economic uh, interdependencies, the cyber competitive, computer related, digital related interdependencies are so much more intertwined. Yeah, that's a really interesting topic. And I know Carney uh, specializes quite a bit in logistics and supply chain. So, yep. so uh, again, maybe without naming names of your clients, but uh, for, for most of your clients that are dependent on China, right? What, what is the base case now recommendation given escalating geopolitical issues? Being, uh, uh, is a recommendation to, to you know, stay the course in China? Is it to diversify? If so where do you diversify your, your, your supply base from? I mean, that, that's really, I mean, obviously that would drive a lot of investment decisions from outside as well. Yeah, there's clearly no one size fits all. And I, I remember spending a lot of time 20, 30 years ago helping Western companies get into China. It was like the Marco Polo, riches beyond compare. Yes, yes, yes. That's all happened. But a lot of those companies have gone completely local. So they're local mm -hmm. for local manufacturing to serve the local consumers. Uh, the companies that are dependent from a global export side, obviously they're looking, you know, import export side are clearly looking at other uh, options, alternative sourcing and shoring of activities. Um, and that's just part of the broader mandate or imperative to have resilient but interdependent supply chains. It has been disrupted. Uh, you can't count on uh, a similar set of backdrop for the next period of years. Uh, you have people and countries that have different time horizons. I mean, China has 10 year, 100 year plans and the US has a <laughs> quarterly reporting cycle for public companies and a four year, two year, six year election cycle for politicians. So uh, that's not gonna go away. But the, the business discipline, the investment policy has to be grounded in a balance, right? Of risk and upside of scenario-based planning. We do a lot of that for our clients. Um, but very few clients are now dependent only on China manufacturing. They have other alternatives. They have to you know, modify certain parts of their business mix. Um, you know, they have pricing alternatives as well. Uh, but China as a market is not going to go away for sure. Well, uh, realistically, Alex, what is the, like, for, for, for a, a large manufacturer, what is the alternative to China? I, I mean, I don't, I mean, maybe, I, I'm not an expert at all, but it seems to me like it is very difficult, if not impossible, to break away from China in, from a scale and cost standpoint, right? I mean, what, yeah, I mean, country, I what country can compete? Yeah, I'm not sure you will have a, a, another country that will replicate everything that China has. I think you have to look at all the global resources and, and uh, alternatives. There's a lot of governments that are trying to improve their manufacturing footprint, whether it's Indonesia or Middle East and Africa. There is low cost labor that needs to have more upskilling in order for them to provide the same level of efficiency, effectiveness, reliability as existing suppliers anywhere in the world. Uh, depending on the sector, if you're looking at high-end pharmaceuticals, you know, I think U.S. or Western countries could probably do a lot more of what they do internally. They just have to pay an economic uh, cost for that. Uh, in relation, again, to the risk of, uh, yeah. you know, and I, so I, I think there are a lot of, I would say, rational policies to diversify from any one source for any one part of your manufacturing supply chain, um, but it will take some time. Right, right now we're helping clients with their scenario planning. Um, you know, these are the, the general levels of options, the general level of economic outcomes, the things that you'd have to believe. 
Uh, we are the thought partner uh, for World Economic Forum on the topic of the future of production, which mm. is a broad term. It includes global value chains and how they will migrate over time, whether it's apparel, which again was the original entry product for a lot of, and light manufacturing and electronics in Southern China. And that grew to all kinds of other things. And, and, and you, you see shifts over time too. I mean, Korea started out very low end and went very, has gone very high end on some key segments of the electronics sector. So if you look at countries out there in the world that have that ambition, a multi-year ambition to be an economic powerhouse in certain sectors, areas, domains, uh, that will happen. There will be alternatives to China in, in hardcore manufacturing. Um, it'll just huh. take time to nurture it. Yeah. Yeah, I think you, you mentioned uh, other parts of Asia, Southeast Asia. I think you mentioned Indonesia and Africa. Uh, to my understanding, again, <laughs> by, by no means the expert, those areas are actually dominated and invested in by ethnic Chinese, right? You know, they, they may be Indonesian or Thai by name, but we, we all know that the, the, the money as well as the management are actually ethnic Chinese with strong ties in terms of capital and relationships and expertise to China. So for let's say an American MNC client that is producing widgets currently primarily out of China, what, what would be the potential options if the geopolitical, especially with China gets much worse, which probably is the case, right? It gets worse before it gets better. What, what are you advising these clients to do? No, I mean, I think, um, you know, again, theoretically you, you, you can make widgets in a number of places, you'll have all kinds yeah. of factor costs and risk decisions. The reality is that a lot of these, as you say, family entrepreneurs, mo many of them ethnic Chinese, but not always. Many of them are Western transplants. They, they, they have been able to take advantage of the human resources and natural resources of multiple places. Um, and even manufacturers originally in Japan and Korea, they use Southeast Asia and China as part of a, a web, a network gotcha. of component gotcha. manufacturers. So that's not gonna go away either. Like I said, I think the days of sort of one country does everything and therefore you have all your risk and you know, all your chips on one part of the table uh, are over, right? You need resilient supply chains. It's gonna look different depending on the sector and the, the company, um, the preferences, the risk appetite, the history of what you have in place, what your in-flight negotiations might be on that. Because over time, every, every manufacturing plan is fungible. Uh, you can eventually locate car manufacturing or Tesla manufacturing in Nevada, Utah, Arizona, or you can manufacture in Eastern Europe or now in Germany. So I think there's a lot of uh, alternatives that any ra again, rational investor has. The question is, do you have enough capital and patience to make it happen? Can you actually communicate a strategy that will keep your investors behind you? Because you know, if you're a, if you're a pessimist, you can look at all the global turmoil and say, boy, nothing's gonna change, it's gonna get even worse but the rational investor will be one that says, no, I found, I found a way through this forest of uncertainty. Here's a way to do it. I found this country or this company or this set of tax incentives that allows me or us to be able to build something for the future. And then I maybe have five of those and not three of those. Like maybe last year you wanted three as re that was your definition of redundancy. And now you need five or six and Africa has to be a part of that solution or Middle East. So you, you mentioned Tesla, are you a fan? I'm not a Tesla driver. I, I don't buy cars or use cars anymore, except on Uber. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm a, I'm, I'm a fan of anything that is much more, you know, carbon negative. Uh, and yeah, I think that's yeah, great. Yeah. yeah, okay. So yeah, as, as in the book, we, we look at a couple of case studies for to apply the 10 commandments of investing. And right. I, I, I'm definitely a must, you know, Gushing. Gushing fanboy and and uh, been a uh, it's been my favorite stock for a number of years. Uh, do you think the Tesla production model really leveraging robotics, serious robotics, and high tech, and obviously diversifying into into a number of continents, is, is that the future for for manufacturing? Well, I mean, I've seen a lot of advanced manufacturing techniques and even um, uh, really super cool stuff, right? Uh, you know, in in Europe in the automotive sector uh, in parallel with what Tesla's doing. I mean, Tesla's what, a big battery and a lot of electronics and some housing. And I think it's, if you simplify to what actually you're making and doing and applying the latest robotics and AI and 
manufactured support technology, uh, you know, I'm pretty optimistic that they're, they're doing the right things. I'm not an expert on Tesla or the automotive sector, um, but I do see across, across a number of industries, alliances to be able to, to take applied technology and uh, to the manufacturing realm, to the that's shop true. floor. I mean, even, even competitors in Germany that are OEMs that have been vertical competitors for years are now collaborating on some of the advanced manufacturing platforms. Okay, okay. All right. Um, sectors. Um, on a five or 10 year view, Alex, are there any sectors that you see emerging as clear or massive winners and losers that, that you, 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 your, 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 your experience and your, your work is telling you? Well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a professional investor, not a day trader, <laughs> so I can't speak in it from a value perspective and where you, where you can get more for your buck, but sure, sure. from a macro trends, clearly, um, clearly the healthcare safe environment area is huge. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there is a lot of activity in the ESG space, in particular, sustainable um, conscious capitalism type of investments in uh, not only the people side, but in particular, carbon reduction. Um, there's some new technology that is now gonna allow us to basically real time trace all the emissions by factory by country. And that allows you to sort of respond as entities, but also companies on how do you do that? I think the recycling of uh, all the stuff that's been manufactured, whether it's chemical manufacturing, um, uh, you know, in finished product versus part products, components, underlying acids, et cetera. That's, there's a huge aspect of that part of the, we call it the circular economy. We, we, yep. there's something that because of our work in supply chain manufacturing and global um, trends in production, uh, we see a lot of activity in what we call the circular economy because supply chains are not one way and they're not clean and they're not stable. <laughs> they are two way volatile and they need to be multi circular. Um, you know, I still am a big fan of technology. You know, I'm a, as an, on an investment side, I just follow the big trends. So I've always for 20, 25 years invested in index stocks and in international and in technology. I'm not allowed because of my role in my company and our profession to invest in individual stocks because we, as you know, sometimes work for competitors or companies and sectors. So, and we have a lot of insider access. So we are not allowed to make individual stock plays, but from a sector perspective, I think international trade and international growth is still there. Um, the technology side of things. Um, and I, I see growth in every individual sector that we serve in, whether it's in banking, I mean, the, the, the substitution of digital payments for traditional going to a retail branch payment, that's going to continue. So we do a lot of work in digital payments, for example. Healthcare, we're helping pharmaceuticals innovate and uh, accelerate how they produce vaccines and treatments, as well as improve the delivery models for healthcare to citizen, citizenry, whether they're in California or, or in Kentucky. Um, you know, in the telco space, which I did a lot of work in, we're trying to make sure that we help our clients, you know, provide better solutions from a B2B and a B2C side, whether it's IoT enabled or AI enabled, cyber secure, cyber protected. Um, so I think there's a lot in the technology, healthcare, and also in the public sector on the infrastructure. There's a huge building boom that's happening because of all the huge fiscal stimulus, clearly, right? To get the that's economies right. out of the doldrums, out of the ditch, uh, but also the replenishment of infrastructure. Growth, gotcha information like that. Those are key sectors. So this, but I, my view is that, you know, Steve, there's, there's a, there's growth in every sector. It's not one versus the other. Um, we do need to manage, I think the environment much more consciously and clearly because, you know, you can't just go from 10 billion people to 15 billion people and assume that the food stocks, the resources, the habitable land, the water supply, all those things will not be there. So I think there's a lot of, I don't know what the answer is, but there'll be some business, uh, cases for helping that become even more sustainable, us become more sustainable. Sure, sure. So yes, opportunities in, uh, in, in all sectors, uh, as it should be, but for um, healthcare, ESG, tech, and the public infrastructure type sectors. Uh, I'm curious on this, I, I did a bit of work on the circular economy. I did a small investment in actually black soldier flies, which consume uh, waste. Um, really? And I know places like the city of Guelph in the Ontario 
are, is trying to, to rebrand and, and develop into a circular economy. I'm just curious, Alex, in your work with Carney, uh, what, what, what is the best example of a successful circular economy city or, or, or company or, you know, however you define it? Well, one thing we're doing, and it's not quite public yet, but is we have trademarked and are a architect of what is called Circular Valley in okay. Europe. You've heard of Silicon Valley, of course, and there are some analogies, right? You need a critical mass of institutions, public sector funding and will, companies that are at stake, right? Whether they're polluters or people that want to pollute less. Uh, and in, in Western Germany, uh, we have been a pioneer and founder of what we call the Circular Valley there. It's still in the early stages and I can't speak too much about it right now, but it's ultimately a consortium and a community of companies and countries uh, that are trying to develop the latest technologies, uh, be a forum and be role models for applying this. So if you're manufacturing elevators as they do in Western, uh -huh. in Western uh -huh. Europe, or if you are a big airline or a chemical producer or a retailer, uh, you are a part of the problem and a part of the solution. So we're trying to apply that concept also in the United States. So there could be a, a circular equivalent, maybe not a valley, maybe it's a basin, maybe it's a mountain, maybe it's a, 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 a hill, hill country. But th there are some aspects of that that um, um, we want to be a founding provocateur for. Outside of that, we are working obviously with a number of companies that are trying to become much more compliant and better citizens on that because it's good economics too, as well as complying with you know Paris Climate Accords or minus 1.5, minus two type of uh, standards in the future being net zero. And we are doing the same ourselves, right? How we address scope one, two, and three emissions. But it's not just carbon, it's also the things that we produce, it's plastics, right? It's disposable. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, th th this may be too detailed, I know it's, it's early. Uh, how, how, how do these economies, these certain economies deal with the waste part? Like like consumer waste again uh, with the with the city of Guelph one one idea was essentially to, to have these bug farms that eat the waste that that are, that are coming from the supermarkets or not have you seen other interesting technologies or products I mean the 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 black fly one is a cool one I mean I yeah <laughs> yeah it's a, it's a crazy, it's crazy bug I don't know the solution I mean I think it seems to me that the simplest solutions are the ones that will be get are the ones that you don't think about are the ones that will probably be uh, ultimately the ones that you count on so I'm the more organic like that, I think the better. Um, all I can say is that I, I know that there is a comprehensive look at the type of approaches, not only demand reduction and management, but also the way we design products, the way we deliver them, the way we actually are physically able to recycle them to try to make it less. And then there's also collecting what's already been made. I mean, there's, you know, as have you, you've seen all the topics, <clears throat> the, the articles about the waste that's circling in the in the middle of the Pacific that's as big as all of Antarctica apparently right? it's just solid waste of plastics what do you do with that how do you you ship it out you just send it into a spaceship using a Tesla spaceship out into <laughs> just get it off planet earth somehow uh so I don't know the answer okay Steve I just uh, I, I'm just I'm confident there's a lot of smart people I know there are a lot of smart people looking at this with with resourcing to succeed uh, and there'll be a plethora of solutions, hopefully, that will astound us. But it couldn't, can't come fast enough. You know, I think we're racing against the clock here on some of these issues. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, Alex, this is great. I've got just two more questions. I know you're super, super busy, so I appreciate this. Um, and I know you're not a professional investor, but uh, I'm going I'm to push you because you have a brilliant mind and even a brilliant, <laughs> crazy experience. Uh, that, so I'm going to push this. Uh, your son or loved one that has no investment experience comes to you and says, hey, daddy, you know, I, I just got $100,000. Uh, where should I invest this $100,000? Invest, not trade, for, let's say, long term, 10, 20 years. And you obviously have no restrictions. You've retired from Carney, and you could put this money anywhere, right? No right answer, no wrong answer. I'm just curious how you would, where you would allocate this capital from a asset class, geography, industry, just, you know, just curious. Where's your money? Where's your money at? Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. I don't have a brilliant portfolio, however brilliant you might think I am. Uh, I, I, you know, <laughs> I, like I said, listen, I mean, I think it's important if you're a principal investor, just have principles, right? So for me, just in my particular modest situation, so I bet on the long-term trends. So like I said at the beginning, I bet on long-term international stocks, 
you know, basically. I bet on um, technology, things that are related to that. I, I can't, I'm not allowed to pick individual stocks. And then I always reserve a little bit of money, mad money, for things that I would say are flyers that are opportunistic. So for me, I've invested in some startups, whether they're solar or whether they're sports media. Now, ironically, my second son is, uh, is, a, is a financial manager. So he, he has this passion, and I would say this to him and to anyone, to sort of follow your passions. Because you know, time, your time is the biggest investment over, over your whole life, not the money that you have. And uh, he likes cryptocurrency. Now, really? his view, his view okay. yeah. And uh, listen, his objective is to have a nine-digit exit in, in eight years. And as far as I can tell on paper, he's on his way. So uh, wow. I gave, gave him a little money, you know, so I'm going to get a little bit of payback, hopefully. Uh, but I think, you know, you got to, you know, it's not just being smart. It's also having the right timing, right? Even the company you and I worked on together. I mean, it was the right company, the right business model. It's just wrong timing, right? Yep. Look at what's yep. happening right now. Everything we talked about 20 years ago is happening. It's just that we exactly. were 20 exactly. years too early. Uh, but I think, uh, like I said, he may get lucky, he may not. Uh, but at the end of the day, I said, you know, don't quit your day job. Uh, so don't put it all on. Don't put it all on red or black at the uh, roulette table either. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. That's good advice. A little bit. That's good advice. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Alex, your immigrant success story is obviously an inspiration to, to anyone, right? Uh, but uh, also being uh, one of the few rare Asian uh, American leaders, right? What, what's your life advice, you know, uh, for, let's say, somebody that's reading a book that whether it's getting to investing or getting, having a successful career as you do, what, what are two or three, two or three things you, you want to share with, with these, uh, with the audience? Well, I mean, a couple things. One that's, one is to run your own race. Hmm. Uh, don't follow the crowd. You may be different, but in, in some cases that's exactly what's needed for that situation, for that industry or for that client. Um, one of the reasons I chose consulting was that in fact, they want diversity. Clients are hiring you because you're different, because you don't know the industry, because you have a different perpendicular perspective. So I'd say sure. just follow your, you know, run your own race, follow your passions. I mean, do what you love, love what you do. I have a podcast on joy at work and I'll apply the same principles that I heard from the people that I interviewed, just like you're interviewing me, which is, you know, you always stretch yourself, uh, be curious, uh, have your reach greater than your grasp. Don't be afraid of failure because as either Abraham Lincoln or Winston Churchill said, success is just basically going from failure to failure with the same level of enthusiasm. If you like what you're doing, it doesn't matter if you have a disappointment from now and then you'll learn from it, you'll become more resilient. So I guess those are the ones that come to mind for me. You know, it's worked for me. I've always been on the outside of society, if you will, you know, the non-dominant part. And you and I know that, you know, you're, you're, you're an immigrant or you're to this or to that, but that just gives you a little bit of a chip on the shoulder. That gives you energy. It gives you perspective on how to play a role and build rapport. But again, you're doing it on your own terms. You know, you're not gotcha. following gotcha. someone else's stereotype gotcha. and you're running your own race. Sorry, to just squeeze in one more. Uh, so <laughs> the, ten, the, the book, 10 Commandments. Yeah, what are those 10 commandments? I got to see those 10 commandments. Uh, well, you, uh, you have to wait for the book, but it <laughs> essentially is, is modeled after the you know, the biblical 10 commandments are essentially a guiding principle right, thou shalt. Okay. that, that is universally applicable to life. Right. So the 10 commandments of investing, we study hundreds of investment wizards and smart people like yourself. And these are commandments that are supposedly applicable to all asset classes, any types of investing. Mm. So, so, so hopefully, hopefully it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a useful book. Now the 10th commandment, uh, which is my last question to your promise is called mind the mind. Because the previous nine, like the Bibles, are actually fairly intuitive. We give examples of what you should and should not do. And, and so thou shalt not kill, for example, it's obvious, right? But people kill. And, and so, so commandment 10 for us, mind and mind means really how do you discipline your mind? How do you make things happen knowing the other nine principles? So, so for Alex Liu, running this massive organization globally, keeping so fit and so young, what are some of the things that you do to mind your mind and to keep discipline, to keep healthy and, and, um, that we can learn from? Well, I mean, I always try to communicate and transmit a spirit of gratitude. Uh, no matter what problems we have, no matter where you are, you should feel grateful for what you have. I, you know, I think we're, I'm a lucky person uh, in a lucky family. I learned from my father 
uh, and he went through much worse than I did. You know, I mean, I don't want to go through the story, but, and he always was smiling. said, you know, I think it's fine. You know, I got my family. I've got my self-respect. I've got my integrity. Uh, I've got my colleagues. And, you know, you, the more you connected with each other, obviously you're happy. So I think uh, there's got to be an overarching spirit of, of gratitude about who we are and gratefulness. And it's not just spiritual, it's not just religious. I think it has to be personally and authentically felt. Um, during the COVID times, there was a lot of sharing of, of lessons learned and things to do. And you know, you need sleep and sunshine, you need diet and exercise, you need friends and family, but you also need a sense of the future, right? You need a sense of purpose. And for those that are working, it's about finding joy in the work that you have and in the colleagues that you have now and looking at the positive side of that. So I, I, I agree with your 10th commandment, which is it's all about your mindset. You have to have a happy future-based forward back mindset for it all to make sense. Otherwise you're just, you're just a rat in a wheel, right? You're just turning around doing what someone else wants you to do. Exactly. That, that's not fun. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, this has been fun. It's amazing to catch up Alex and, uh, a lot of a lot of learnings. We'll uh, we'll get this posted as soon as possible, and hopefully, uh, you know, lots of people will learn from it as as I have. Well, we'll see. Well, same here. I appreciate the opportunity to catch up with you, and good luck to you and your family. Great to hear about them as well. Thank you, Alex. Bye now. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you for joining us. Please visit Wizards Institute to access the blog summary of today's session, to learn more about other speakers, and to network with other investment wizards. Wizards Institute, the number one community to learn smart investing and financial freedom.